And thank you to all of you for being here and being a part of this experience today. We want to continue it for you right now with our next presenter. Richard Cope is the founder of NanoLumens. It's the creator of a thin and flexible video display screen. And today, his sharing with us is on inventions and anatomical discourse. So, Richard Cope. Let's talk for a minute about innovation and invention and the ecosystem that goes around it because that's why you're all sitting here with iPhones and laptops and all these cool things that you get to use and love to use. And if you think back through a little bit of history, you'll remember that about 1000 AD, Western Europe started emerging in comparison to the rest of the world. And about 400 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution took place, it accelerated the pace. And over the last couple of hundred years, especially here in the U.S., the pace of innovation and invention again significantly accelerated. But what is the cycle? Lots of theorists write about it. I spent 40 years living it around the world and have fallen off more turnip trucks than I can count. So I've got the bruises to go with the cycle that I'm going to show you here because it matters. If you don't care for it like your garden, it goes away. And if it goes away, all the new cool stuff you want in the future won't be there. But first, take a couple side trips. First, to the spirits of high school past with Henry David Thoreau. Why him? Well, I think he spent a few two winters, winters on Walden's Pond because he wrote this that everybody knows. Build a better mousetrap when the world will be the path to your door. It is the worst thing for inventors and innovators to ever hear because it's not true. And yet, how many people do you know who said, I've got a better thing, and they're all going to come buy it, and they never show up? This has done more to crush more dreams than any other poet that I know of. <laughs> and maybe we should have kept him up there for a few more winters in Walden Pond with the snow they've had recently. Let's take a definition, an invention. An invention is a thing you can patent. It's a specific thing that has to have an inventive step. And generally, though, isn't what you bring into the marketplace. An invention is maybe a chemical compound for a drug. Other than that, what you bring into the marketplace, and this is a great example, is an innovation. An innovation can contain an invention, but mostly it's made up of other pre-existing things packaged as a device or service that you want to offer into the marketplace hoping to get adoption. So let's take that construct and build an innovation cycle because there's a micro cycle and a macro cycle within the land of innovation that you need to understand. First is it doesn't start with the innovation. It starts with a problem. If you had no problems, why would you ever come up with something new? Necessity really is the mother of invention. So let's take two German engineers who weren't particularly happy with their boss, a guy named Otto. Otto had no HR skills. If they had HR back then, he would be in big trouble. Well, Otto invented an engine that worked back then off coal gas, which you couldn't move it around. These guys wanted to do something different. He said no. They quit, went and started their own company. And what they wanted to make is an engine that ran this new stuff called kerosene, but they couldn't figure out how to get the kerosene into the engine to make it work right. Until one day, one of them saw, and we don't quite know who, but some young lady with one of these things. Do you remember this from your grandmother? A little squeeze the bulb, makes the perfume come out? That's called an venturi atomizer. When you put that on an engine, you get a carburetor. And what do you get? An engine that moves around. Well, the second step, third step rather, in the cycle is not what you think. It's this, competition. And competition includes doing nothing. And horses were cheap, and you fed them some grass, and they moved around, so buying an engine that moved around didn't have a lot of adopters, because that's the next step in an innovation cycle, adopters. And so they were struggling, and they weren't making much money. Finally, the guy on the left, Mr. Daimler, said to the guy on the right, Mr. Maybach, let's take this thing and wrap a car around it, and maybe we can sell that. And they did. So to get their engine sold, they had to wrap it in a vehicle, and then sell the entire vehicle, and that's the second level of innovation it took them to get into the marketplace. And finally, they reached the land we all hope to reach as innovators, and that's one of profitability. But, as many of you know, when the profits start rolling in, there's generally somebody on the side who provided some capital to get you going. 
and they want some of that back. And that's the first cycle inside the innovation macro cycle is this capital cycle. Because the best VCs in the world, and I've been one, fund 10 companies, six fail, two break even, and two succeed. But those two that succeed have to generate enough cash to refill that capital bucket so they can go bet on 10 more. Because nobody has any way known to find the winners from the very beginning. So this macro cycle in here has to work, or when it stops, new companies don't get funding. Apple doesn't get born. But there's another cycle outside of this that's even bigger. And it's the one that really drives the pace of innovation. And that's this. The capital guy, he gets certain rights, right? People with gold make the rules. Well, he said, I want you to make some more vehicles, and I'd like you to name it after my favorite daughter, Mercedes. <laughs> Which is why lots of you now drive a Mercedes. But having been, built a carburetor, they created what? New knowledge. And with that new knowledge came the opportunity to create new things that didn't exist before and to improve upon those things. So now there's 100 car companies. What do you need? Roads, highways, off-ramps, traffic police, automated robots that give you tickets when you go through the light like I got last week. <laughs> All that kind of great stuff comes out of this macro cycle because the knowledge base that's been created now gives you the ability to feed the next innovation cycle. Three things are important. Freedom. Freedom to fail. Freedom to profit from your invention, which is why the entire patent system was created. Think about that. The patent system gives you a monopoly on your invention for 20 years so you can go profit from it. Information spread. First scrolls, then books, our first random access memory device. Don't think so. Flip to page 526. Look at line 24. That's random access. And then cash. Capital has to have the right governmental structures so that it's free to invest in opportunities. And so there's a mechanism through the economics and the government and the taxation system for you to recover that capital that you've invested when that company becomes successful. If you don't have these three things as a foundation for innovation and invention, it stalls out. Or it never happens at all. Innovation and invention is not the norm throughout history. Think back. Why is it that it took off in Europe? Because all those things came into place quite accidentally. And then as capitalists started making money on it, they promoted, let's have some patents. Let's have banking laws. Let's have the ability to recover that capital and do it again and again. And the byproduct of that are the things that you hold in your hands today. Let's look at one more, Thomas Edison. He didn't invent the light bulb. Light bulb been around for about 80 years. What he invented was a longer lasting light bulb. So here's Thomas Edison giving a presentation to his investors, right? I want to make a light bulb and we're going to sell it to all these people. Well, excuse me, but do they have electricity in their house? Well, no, they don't. <laughs> but this is going to be really good. Well, how are they going to run their light bulb? Well, in parallel, Edison came over and invented an electrical distribution system with some investors, built a first power station at Pearl Street, wired up 200 homes so they could buy his light bulb. So sometimes to get your innovation out there, you have to develop something other than the initial thing that you went after. The power plant, Pearl Street, and the electrical distribution system. But then, what did he figure out? If you run the power plant, you make money no matter whose light bulb they use. And that's why, back in those days, there were a whole lot of Edison electric power plants around because they figured out that making light bulbs was great. As many VCs will tell you, recurring revenue is even better. <laughs> Let's look at one more. iPhone. I know many of you have those wonderful devices in your pockets. But Apple didn't invent the phone, did they? They didn't invent the LCD screen. And why do you think that LCD screen is on your iPhone? Because all the guys you generally don't like at home watching sports want a really big TVs, that's why. And so they had Gen 2 plants, and then Gen 3, and then Gen 9, and now Sharp just built a Gen 10 plant that cost $1 billion, so they can shove out the back of it 1,065 inch LCDs a month. Well, remember this little Gen 2 plant down here? It can't make big TVs. It's just a little baby. 
but it can make little screens. So the guys running that plant said, we can shut it down or we can find something else to do with this stuff. So they went to all the phone makers and said, hey, we can make cool little screens. And lots of people said, really neat, but they suck power. What are you going to do with them? Apple said, let's do two things. Let's put a two-finger interface touch on it. And let's do what? Apps. Because what's your iPhone without apps? And so what Apple did is they concocted a phone that was more of an interactive device than simply a thing you talk on. And as you all know, there's probably a joke going around about when are they going to have an app that actually lets you make a phone call with an iPhone. <laughs> and I hear it's coming. But I want to use this example to talk about money. Because you hear lots of people talk about manufacturing. And it's important to have manufacturing jobs, and it's important to have manufacturing in the U.S. That's all true. But the guys that make the iPhone for 189 bucks make about $10 a phone. Now, true, you say you make millions, that kind of adds up to real money after a while. But the innovator is where the real cash comes from. Apple, we hear, makes on average $300 for every iPhone sold. So do you want to be the innovator or do you want to be the manufacturer? Apple also gets $15 a month from your service provider and sells you all the apps that goes on that phone. Now, what does Apple do with all that money? Well, they are engineers, researchers, software programmers, genius bar guys, and all those other high-paying, valuable jobs that allows it to go on innovating and creating new things that didn't exist before so they can stay in the land of outsized margins and not be reduced to a commodity manufacturer. Innovation needs to have as much attention as manufacturing. Because innovation is what makes us, over the last 200 years, the world economy, because we took those outside profits from things we shipped around the world and brought them back here to create more innovation. But all's not well. There's some challenges here. And I'm kind of reaching the end of my ability to influence things, but you guys, many of you are in the beginning. Innovation cycle needs care and feeding like your garden. If you don't go out there and take care of it, weeds grow up, it all goes away. And that's beginning to happen to us. Let's take the first one, capital. What do Apple, Microsoft, and Home Depot all have in common? They can't do an IPO today. If they weren't able to do an IPO, they would eventually have been bought by some larger organization. And all those really great innovative guys, they're just dying to work on a corporate staff, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, not. So they'd all leave. And the things you all love would have never come to be. Only because they were able to do an IPO, only because they were able to say separate and individual, only because they were able to retain their leadership and follow their vision wherever it took them, were we able to have Google and Apple and all the things that we love today. Without the financial marketplace, that won't happen. Enrod and WorldCom were bad. But is it bad enough to shut down the entire capital return cycle? I would suggest not. Second part that we've got some challenges with is patents. Now, over in Europe, over the last couple of years, they've reformed their patent law, if you call it that, and made it harder, more expensive, more difficult for individuals to get patents, and easier for corporations to challenge those patents. Well, just recently, our wonderful Congress harmonized. Makes you feel good when you say that, doesn't it? Harmonized. Our patent law with the Europeans. Now, what that means in English is they made ours as bad as theirs. So now, starting next year, it will be harder to get a patent, cost more to get a patent, easier for large companies to challenge that patent and keep you in court till you run out of money, and therefore, they win first to file rights. Harmonizing our stuff with the other guys that aren't good is not the way to go. The third is government interference in the free marketplace. Now, whether you think solar and electric cars are good or bad is indifferent. If you're the one that gets the loan for the solar company, or if you're the electric car company that gets the loan, that's great. But if you're not the one that gets the loan, it kind of stinks. That's unfair competition. Especially since the marketplace hasn't figured out who really is going to be the winner. 
And our government's pretty good. The military is the one thing they do well, and all the rest ends up like the post office and Amtrak. So you really don't want the government fingers telling you what works in the free market. But these things, this care and feeding, this lobbying for this economic cycle that will give us more and more innovations, that will deliver us the profits that are outsized to manufacturing, that will support intelligent, high-paid jobs, is now falling into your hands to maintain. Us old guys have done it over the last 40 years. You new folks are the ones that need to go fix this capital problem, this patent problem, and this government interference problem and get them out of your ability to start a company and make a profit. And that's my challenge to you. Thank you.